Gary, it was a tricky opening period for them, but after that, quite comfortable. Yeah, it ended up being comfortable. Um, but I always say that when you play these games, the right way to reflect upon them is think about what you said before the game and think about what everybody was thinking before the game, that it would be really tough that I think the words that we used when we were introducing the match were that I think we thought England would have to suffer to come through it. You remember four years ago against Colombia, it was obviously um, on the edge of your seat stuff, that really, in terms of penalties. Uh, and we expected that last night. I expected it to be a lot tougher. So you've got to give a lot of credit uh, to Gareth and to the players for making it as comfortable as it is because it's OK now saying, yeah, we have better players. They had a couple of players missing, Kiati and uh, Drissa Gay through injury um, and, and suspension. All these things you can say after the game, but not many people were saying it before the game. Actually, Roy Keane was the only person um, that was emphatic before the game. He said, this will be a really comfortable night and England will win. You know, he, he said three or four. I didn't hear any English uh, fans say that and certainly none of the English coaches or media were saying that before the game so no well done to, the, to, to, to Gareth to the, to the team for making what was a tricky encounter look quite simple in the end We'll get stuck into the performance properly but one of the things that the camp had to deal with prior to the game and in particular Raheem Sterling a very horrid situation for yeah. him with that armed robbery with his family at home, his children at home. He's left the camp to go and deal with that. How will he be feeling? Because obviously it's a huge thing. He's so committed to England. There's a, you know, a chance to do really well in this tournament again. And he's taken the decision to go home because rightly the welfare of his children comes first. Yeah, I mean, it's horrific. Um, we obviously heard couple of hours before kickoff, that Raheem wouldn't be part of the match day squad. Didn't know initially what that was actually for and what were the reasons behind it. Um, but I think Joe you know, football, what it, told, what it tells us is obviously that there's still very bad things happening um, in the world and we should reflect upon that. Um, but also the way in which football, Gareth, the England team, the English media actually deal with these things now a lot more respectfully, um, you know, with compassion and empathy, putting... Uh, football aside, putting people first, that wouldn't have always happened 20 years ago. There would have been probably a different reaction from all sides. You know, the player maybe would have felt that he couldn't go home, that he couldn't probably, to be fair, feel comfortable to have that discussion. The manager and the sort of staff might have been a little bit more sort of what would be, well, you know, what can you do there? You know, we'll look after your family and stay here. We've got, we've got a game to win. And the English media probably would have treated it differently as well. So I think we're all in a better place to be able to deal with it properly. But all our thoughts, obviously, with Raheem and his family, because I think the reality of it is, and we've seen Ben White go home a couple of weeks ago as well, um, it's right that, obviously, you make, we make sure that people come first, that families come first, that football is really uh, secondary to these very important issues. Uh, but obviously, it's a horrific incident and something that, you know, can't believe it's happened. We're seeing these armed robberies and footballers being targeted, an escalation of it. Is that concerning? Very concerning. Um, obviously, there is an element of knowing when they're away because they're on television in a different country. Uh, and, yeah, totally unnerving. It's been happening now for quite a few years. Um, People will always look to exploit. People will always look to, to do things that are bad in the world. We know that. And um, it doesn't just happen sort of if in different parts of the world. It happens in our country. And we, 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 we let's say it's, it's, it's disgusting. We, 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 there's no other words for it, really. Back to England. A quarter final. France, the opponents. But before we get stuck into what to expect from France, talk me through Jude Bellingham's performance. Absolutely brilliant performance. Um, it's easy to talk about the goals, the impact on the goals and the sort of way in which obviously he contributed in that way. But I thought even in the first 10, 15 minutes of the game, when I always think when games are the most difficult for your team, who is the player then that sort of, if you like, stands out? And he stood out in England's most difficult part of the game, I felt which I think is equally pleasing as the actual part where England were on top and he just looked like a sensation. Um, the thing for me is that obviously we, we've been become obsessed over the last 10 or 15 years with trying to describe what type of midfield player every midfield player is. You get put into bo boxes, you're compartmentalised into you're either a holding player, um, you're a box-to-box -box player or you're a goal-scoring midfield player or you're a number 10. This lad can do everything, absolutely everything. And they're, only, they're very unique players. Uh, I was in the studio last night with one Roy Keane um, that's 
could do everything. Um, I think Steven Gerrard could do everything. I mean, you could defend, he could pass, he could attack. Um, these are very, very unique talents in, in world football um, and, you know, ones that I played with and that's what he reminds me of. And for me to put him in that category, that is really high praise because you couldn't make me talk any higher than sort of the, about those types of players, about their ability to basically contribute in different areas of the pitch. So, yeah... How at 19 he's delivering it, though, is the unique part. Because, like I say, Roy Keane wasn't delivering it at 19 and neither was Steven Gerrard. Um, it was a little bit later. What he's doing now in a World Cup, I, I've not seen before. Um, it's, it's breathtaking and um, something that ultimately will attract, I'm sure, a lot of interest from English Premier League clubs. Speaking of that, were you a little <laughs> bit unnerved by how close him and Jordan Henderson are? Are we no, going to read it? Any, the, any more into that? The whole thing unnerves me, you know. When I was in the camp sort of 15 years ago, I used to sort of get close to Rooney, get close to Rio Ferdinand, all those players that you thought we could just grab. And now you see Phil Foden next to Jude Bellingham. You see Trent Alexander-Arnold going for a walk with him. You see Jordan Henderson cuddling up to him at the end of the game and thinking, you sneaky little so I know what you're trying to do, you lot. Um, and that's the reality of it at this moment in time. He's likely to, more likely to go to Liverpool than Manchester City. Um, just because of where they're at. What they're what they're doing, uh, but you don't you can't rule out one of the big European clubs either, and you can't certainly rule out what Chelsea or Manchester United might try and do financially to try and sort of wrestle him away. But there's also Declan Rice in that in that midfield as well, who I thought played well last night. It was, it was his best game of the tournament, um, and he's available or coming available probably in the next six months. Obviously, he's been brilliant for West Ham. So you're going to have two of England's most brightest talents. Um, in midfield, Declan Rice, 23 years of age, I think he is. De uh, Jude Bellingham, 19. All coming on the market in the summer, probably, and uh, it'll be a, 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 I say, intense battle to try and get the signatures of those two because they're, they're, they're fantastic professionals. They're good lads. How they speak on on off the pitch uh, is is fantastic. I mean, Bellingham's interview last night was. That's not the interview of a 19-year-old player. I know he is 19-year-old, but that's not... You, know, you, you protect 19-year-olds. You shield them. You no need to shield him. He can sort of speak as maturely as an experienced player. It's 29. You speak about ages, interviews, players that performed well. We had Phil Foden saying he doesn't want a big uh, Jude Bellingham up because he's too young. Can we please <laughs> remember Phil Foden's age? And then he says he doesn't want to big him up, but he's going to be the best midfielder in the world. Yeah. Um, I saw that interview with Phil Foden. Um, I still think Foden's special, um, and I think he proved it last night again. Just, it just, it's effortless watching Foden play football. Even his pass, you know, the, the third goal where he just he pushes it back. He just waits for the defender to come close to him. And I know this from being a right back. You know, the easy thing sometimes is to pass it back quickly and the defender's four or five yards off you or three, three yards off you and then they can stop. He waits, he waits, he waits, he pops it off and then spins around the corner. And that's how the goal comes about. His intelligence, his efficiency, his knowledge in, of, of when to play the ball, his weight of pass, the one that he puts through the legs of Koulibaly to put it into sort of Saka's uh, path. He was absolutely brilliant last night and he makes very, very difficult things look easy, Phil Foden. Um, He's won nine major trophies. He's won four Premier League titles, Phil Ford. And I said last night before the game, there will be a view that says, well, yeah, he's won four Premier League titles because he's playing with great players at a great club with a great manager. To live in that company that he's living in, to be in that company, to play there every single day and to play in that team, you have to be special. Pep Guardiola made it damned hard for him to get into that team. He didn't give him a free pass. He didn't say, oh, he's a talented young English player. Get him in, get him in. All the sort of razzmatazz sometimes we throw around English players and young English players and say, give him a chance. He never did that. He's had to work hard for his City career. He's had to work hard for his, for his, um, for his England career. And he's having to justify himself. But he was amazing. And he can speak really well. Um, he's got that little bit of devil in him as well, which I like. Uh, but him and, him and Bellingham, you know, Saka's talented, Rashford's talented, Grealish is talented. But those two are... Uh, another level to the point whereby they can become world-class, uh, not just world-class in potential, but world-class delivery over the next few years.
and what they will be facing will also be world class. Kylian yeah. Mbappe, France. But England have shown they can endure periods in games, they can enjoy periods in games, clean sheets, midfield clicking, scoring goals, yeah. Harry Kane on the score sheet as well. So how do you rate that battle against France? I, I just think it's one of those games of a lifetime on Saturday. Um I think back to my own career when I played in games like that um, in Euro 96 or in you know 2004 and 6 we played against Portugal with Figo and Ronaldo on the wide, in the wide areas uh, in 2004 2006 it was it was it was Cristiano playing on the right hand side it was Samao playing on the left and think of these games that are once in a lifetime twice in a lifetime opportunities and you know thinking about England on Saturday playing against France on a Saturday night in a World Cup quarter final they don't come around in your life very often they don't, honestly. They are big, 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 big moments. I can't wait for it. Um, I don't think the lads will be able to wait for it. And, you know, I'm not taking the pressure off us and saying that, you know, France are favourites, England are underdogs, all that sort of stuff. But this is a game we can lose. We know that. They've got incredible players. They're world champions. They're a fantastic team. So we can go and enjoy it. I always think when you're playing in a game like this, in some ways, it puts less pressure, it's less pressure than actually the games whereby you're playing against, say, a Senegal, because a Senegal, you get knocked out, all hell breaks loose for the coach, for Gareth, for the staff, for the FA, for the players. You lose on Saturday, unless it's an absolute shambles, which it won't be, I don't think. You know, you're going to come out with of the tournament. I think quarterfinals par. I used to think that quarterfinal was par, second round's bogey, and you're going to have a few issues. You might get through it, but you're going to have to recover quickly. Quarterfinals par, semi-finals a birdie, finals in Eagle and win it, it's an albatross. And that's how I always saw a tournament, to be fair. And you get to a quarterfinal, that's what England should be you know, thinking about as their level. This team think beyond that. They'll be thinking they can beat France on Saturday. Brilliant game to look forward to. I can't wait for it. I think that the, you know it'll be watched by tens and tens of millions in our country, but all around the world as well, hundreds of millions. Mbappe, I think we've got the best right-back in the world to be able to deal with him. That's not saying we've got the best right-back in the world, but I think in terms of physicality, pace, experience, I couldn't think of anybody better to match Kylian Mbappe than Kyle Walker. Now, that doesn't mean to say you'll keep him quiet for 90 minutes because... Mbappe's sensational. He's so special, it's untrue. It's very difficult to do that. But we've got a chance because we've got a player there who can actually match him in certain areas. And he certainly won't give him, I don't think, the space that he was afforded against Poland in the box in the last sort of 25, 30 minutes where he scored those goals. So I think we've got a chance. Um, but more than that, I am proud, to be fair. I think this, English, this group of England players and this manager have done more for English football than any that I can ever remember in my lifetime on the pitch and off the pitch. I keep saying that because they handle themselves brilliantly with everything that they do. They behave properly. They interfere with things outside of football that brings better lives to other people. They play football really well. They deliver in tournaments. And the coach, to be fair, got a rough ride on the way into this tournament. We should trust him. Um, you know, I, I was a little bit, just after, I think it was the second game, I thought forward and should play. That's the only thing that I really probably in four years have probably said that would potentially be would deemed to be a criticism of Gareth. It wasn't really a criticism, it was just an observation around forward and I feel really sort of passionate about that one. But the criticism that they were receiving, the players and the, and the, you know about the Nations League, that, that Nations League is shambles. Those four games last summer, I said it before this tournament, so I'm not just saying it now. Let's be really clear, they're a shambles then. You know, they were, they were absolutely rubbish um, and that's not disrespecting international football. That's just saying where these players are at. These need, they need big tournaments. They need these types of games. And they delivered for us. And I trust them on Saturday to put in a brilliant performance. It'll be very tough, though, as we know.